Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston, and today we're going to learn about something called the chain rule, which is another method for taking derivatives of more complicated functions than we've seen so far in this course. Okay, so what is it? Well, the setup here is what happens to derivatives if we compose two functions together? In other words, what happens if we have one function inside of another function? And we know how to take their derivatives individually, but you know, how do we how do we take the derivative when they're when they're nested inside each other like that? Okay, so for example, I mean if we got a function like this, h of x equals e to the power of minus x squared, well, the way to think about that function is there's this minus x squared, we know how to take the derivative of minus x squared, but that's nestled inside another function, that's nestled inside of the function e to the power x, which we also know how to take the derivative of. Okay, but how do you take the derivative of this whole thing now? If one function that you know is nestled within another function that you know, how do you take the derivative of that composite function? So that's the problem that we're going to look at today. And just to give a little bit of notation here, we're usually going to refer to this inside function as g of x and the outside function as f of x. And then the, the composite function is h of x. It's what you get if you put g within f, okay? So in this case, g, the inner function, is this minus x squared, and f, the outer function, is the exponential function. It's e to the power of the input. Okay, so what do you do? Well, Let's think about sort of average rates of change rather than instantaneous rates of change first, okay? Because actually the answer is very intuitive. The way that you get this composite rate of change, it's very intuitive and you do it all the time. So let's think about a real world example first. Okay, so let's imagine that we're driving down the road at 80 kilometers an hour and we know that our car, it burns roughly nine liters of gasoline per 100 kilometers that you drive, okay? Then the question that we're gonna ask is, well, how much gas does our car burn per hour if we take these two rates of change into account how much gas do we burn per hour if we're driving at this speed okay and let's take a second to think about this okay this is the type of problem that you've done before okay you've seen situations like this okay all that you do is you multiply these two rates of change together right you've got two rates of change here you've got kilometers per hour and you've got liters per kilometer Okay? And if you just multiply them together, what happens is your units just cancel out, how you would hope, right? Okay, kilometers on the bottom cancels with kilometers on the top, and all you're left with is a rate that's now in liters per hour. Okay? And that's exactly what we want. We want a measure of how much gas is per, per hour, and we get that in liters per hour. So then you just do that multiplication, and you find that, well, you're going to burn roughly 7.2 liters of gasoline per hour if you're driving at that speed and your car is this fuel efficient. Okay, well, that's the setup that we're in, right? We've got two rates of change and we want to find out the composite rate of change. Well, you just multiply the individual rates of change together. So let's break down this example really, really carefully. What did we do? Well, we started off in a world where we were, we were measuring things in hours, right? How long have we driven? So let's call that X, okay? The number of hours that we've driven is X. Okay, and then we had some function, let's call it g, that transformed hours into kilometers, right? This is, we were traveling at 80 kilometers per hour, okay? It's a function that transforms how long have you been driving into, well, how far did you drive in that time period? Okay, so it's a function that transforms hours into kilometers, let's call it g, and let's call the output y. So the number of kilometers that we've drawn, or sorry, number of kilometers that we've driven is y. Okay, and yeah, we said on the previous slide that the rate of change of y, the derivative of y with respect to x, it's 80 kilometers per hour. The rate of change of kilometers with respect to hours is 80. Okay, but then we've got this other function too. We've also got a function that's transforming the number of kilometers that we've driven into the number of liters of gasoline that we burn through. So let's call that number of liters that we burn through z, and let's call it the function that transforms these two variables into each other. Let's call it f. Okay, right, f was this function, it, it transforms, if we know the number of kilometers that we've driven, then we can compute the number of liters of gasoline that we burned, okay? And the rate of this, the rate of change of this function was nine liters per hundred kilometers, okay? That's the rate of change of the liters with respect to the kilometers that you've driven. Okay, so those were the two rates that were given to us. But then what we were interested in is, well, what if we just skip the middleman? What if we don't care about how many kilometers we've driven? We just want to know, based on the number of hours that we've driven, how many liters of gasoline we burned. Okay, and what is the rate there? What is the rate of change of liters with respect to the hours that we've driven? Okay, and the way that we computed that, well, let's just, again, use our sort of uh, dz by dx or dy by dx notation here. 
The way we computed this rate of change is we just multiplied the individual rates of change, right? The rate of change from here to here times the rate of change from here to here gives you the overall rate of change from the start to the very end. And we multiplied those two together and we got 7.2 liters per hour as our rate of change. Okay, and sort of the way to think about this, like, uh, I mean, um, it's a little bit of an abuse of notation, but the way to think about this is like the dy is just sort of cancel and you're just left with dz over dx. I mean, that's only strictly speaking true for average rates of change, but then an instantaneous rate of change is just the limit of average rates of change and everything still works out in the limit. So it really is, it's okay to think about it like that. Okay, and this procedure, this multiplying two rates to get you a composite rate, it's called the chain rule. That's what the chain rule is. It tells you how to take the derivative of a composite function. Okay, so now we're gonna write it down a little bit more formally, but it is just what we talked about. Suppose that you've got one function g that transforms x into y, and then you've got another function f that transforms y into z. So your input variable is being transformed twice, right? It goes from x to y to z. So then the way that you find the rate of change of z with respect to x is you just multiply together the individual rates of change, right? The rate of change as x goes from x to y, okay? And that's all this is. And then times the rate of change as y goes from y to z. So this term here, and the way, again, you can think about this is, I mean, in a sense, the dy's, they're just canceling out. Again, there's a theorem in the background here, really, you know, this dy over dx notation, it's shorthand for a limit, right? Because derivatives are instantaneous rates of change, which are limits, but it's okay to think about this. You won't go too wrong here. Okay? And then all you're left with is the dz by, dz by dx on both the left and right hand side. So they're equal to each other. When using the chain rule though, it's very common to change notation from this, okay? We don't often give variable names x and y and z to the different pieces of the input and output process here. Instead, we often say, okay, well, hey, I know y equals g of x, so I'm gonna sub that inside of f here. And that means that the function I'm interested in is f of g of x. And when I think about it like that, what's happening is my derivative, well, if I just change notation here, the derivative of this big composite function, remember this is z, the derivative of f of g of x, it's equal to the product of the individual derivatives, okay? And that's all we said before. This is the exact same thing as what we had on the previous slide. The derivative of z, ah, that's the same as the derivative of f of g of x. And then this is the derivative of g, in other words, the derivative of y. And then derivative of f, well, that's the, you know, derivative of z with respect to y now. This is the dz by dy piece. Okay, but we're sort of not happy with this formula here because our answer depends on two different variables. It depends on x, but it also depends on y. So then I'm just gonna make one final substitution. I'm just gonna replace, hey, this y equals g of x. So I'm just gonna sub that in there, okay? So what I get at the end of the day is the derivative of the composite function. It's still just the product of two individual rates of change, right? Here I've got one rate of change times another rate of change. You just have to be a little bit careful to make sure that the f prime piece, you're plugging g into it, okay? And the reason for that is you don't want the derivative of f with respect to x. f doesn't take x in. That wouldn't even make sense. f takes y in, so you want the derivative with respect to y. So this, this is y on the inside, right? That's what my input to f has to be. Okay, so that's what the chain rule is. It's just the product of the two individual rates of change. Okay, so let's go through a couple of examples and we'll start off with this example function e to the power minus x squared that we already saw earlier in this lecture. Okay, so how do we take the derivative of that? Well, the key thing that you've got to do is you've got to identify what's the inside function, what's the outside function. That's the key thing. That's the hardest step of using the chain rule. So I'm gonna go down here, just gonna remind myself of what the chain rule says. I'm looking to find an outside function f, take its derivative, and I'm looking to find an inside function g and take its derivative. So with this one, we already talked about this a little bit. The inside function is minus x squared, right? That's my g of x. That's the function on the inside of this function. So that's gonna be my g. I start off, I take the derivative of it. I know the derivative of minus x squared is just minus two x. That's the power rule. All right, great. So that's one piece of the chain rule. So I sub that in there. I've got one half of it now. I've got g prime of x. Next up, I've got to identify what my f is so that I can compute f prime, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a little substitution in my original function. I'm not gonna think of it in terms of x anymore. So I'm replacing the inside function just by y, okay? Or g, same thing, okay? So now my function is just e to the y. And that is my outside function. Once you forget about what your inside function is and just call it y, now you've got your outside function. So e to the power y is my outside function. That's my f of y. All right, so f of y equals e to the power y. How do you take the derivative of that with respect to y? 
I know the derivative of e to the something is just e to that something, okay? E, remember the exponential function is this very nice function that doesn't change when you take its derivative. All right, so f prime of y is e to the power y. That's not quite what I want though. I want f prime of g of x, okay? So again, now just substitute back, right? y is g of x, but I don't want it in terms of y. I want it in terms of x. So I'm just gonna plug that in. y equals g of x. That's why I was able to make that change on the left. And y, well, g of x equals minus x squared. So e to the y equals e to the g of x equals e to the minus x squared. All right, so that's my other rate of change. That's my f prime of g of x. And now I just sub that in on the left half of the chain rule. Okay, so that's just all of my work. And now I clean things up a little bit, just to remind me of what the question is and to simplify the answer down a little bit. The question was, what's the derivative of e to the power minus x squared? Well, it's minus 2x times e to the power of minus x squared. Okay, so I just simplified things down. I just did regular sort of algebra and simplifications there. No more calculus after that last step. Okay, and once you get quicker at these, once you do more and more examples, you're, you're going to be able to do them a lot quicker without all of those in intermediate steps, right? Look at what's happening here. The original function was e to the something, so the derivative is just e to the something, because that's the derivative rule for exponential functions. But then what happens is you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. You multiply by the derivative of minus x squared, which is minus 2x, right? So that's the way to think about the chain rule. It's just, you know... You take the derivative of the outside, you multiply by the derivative of the inside. And that's all we did here. We broke it down into a million different steps, but that's all we did. Derivative of outside times derivative of inside. So let's do another example, okay? So this time our function is going to be h of t equals ln of t cubed minus t. Okay, so first off, the fact that the independent variable here, this input variable is called t instead of x, does not matter. It changes nothing, okay? It's just all of your x's are t's now, okay? It doesn't, doesn't matter what the variable is called. So don't get tripped up on that. Okay, so again, we're just going to start off by writing down what the chain rule is so that we know what pieces we're looking for. Okay, we've got to break it down into h of t equals f of g of t. We want an inner and an outer function. Okay, and then you take the derivative of the outer function and multiply by the derivative of the inner function. All right, so we look at this function here and we say, oh, ln of something, and it's an ugly something. So that ugly something is going to be our inner function, and then the natural log of it, the ln of it, that's our outer function. Okay, so let's do this. Let's call t cubed minus t. Let's call that our g of t. That's our inner function, t cubed minus t. Okay, so then we take its derivative, g prime. Again, we can just use the power rule for this. It's going to be 3 t squared minus 1, just using the power rule. And we're going to plug that in down here. g prime of t is 3 t squared minus 1. Good, we found the inner piece and we found its derivative. Now, let's substitute back in, okay? t cubed minus t, we want to forget about that inner piece now. So just replace it by y. That whole inner chunk is just y. And now we look at this, that's our outer function. Once you forget about the inner function, what you're left with is the outer function. So our outer function is f of y equals ln of y. Then you take the derivative of that. What's the derivative rule for ln of something? Ah, it's one over that something. Okay, so derivative rule, you're gonna get f prime equals one over y. And now just substitute back in. What is y? Uh, y is g of t, which is t cubed minus t. So just sub that back in. So it's 1 over y, which is 1 over t cubed minus t. Just because we want our final answer in terms of t's, the input variable, right? All right, and now we can substitute this down in here for the other half of the chain rule, and we get our final answer. It's 1 over t cubed minus t times 3t squared minus 1. So again, just the product of the two individual rates of change. And let's just clean up our work a little bit again and remind us what the question was. The question was, what's the derivative of ln of t cubed minus t? Well, it's this fraction down here, okay? I just combined it into one fraction. I multiplied the, the 3t squared minus 1 times the other fraction. Okay, and again, to get a little bit quicker at this and to see what's going on, see what's going on here, well, what happened? How did we get this derivative? Well, I took the derivative of ln and I got one over the inside of the ln, one, one over whatever's on the inside, one over to the t cubed minus t. And then you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So what's the derivative of the t cubed minus t? That's ah, the 3t squared minus one. Okay, so once you get more comfortable with this, again, you won't have to do all those intermediate steps, okay? It's just derivative of the outside, ah, one over the inside, and then times the derivative of the inside, the 3t squared minus one. All right, so that's it for the chain rule. I will see you guys for one more derivative rule after this. We're going to talk about the quotient rule in the next lecture. So how to take the derivative of a function divided by another function. So I'll see you for that soon.